Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Digging Deep service of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Olive Tree Parish, Banana Island, Lagos. The topic for tonight's lesson is Fight the Good Fight of Faith. And our anchor passage is 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Praise the Lord. Shall we pray? Almighty and everlasting King of glory, our Lord and our God, the mighty and great God, Father, we acknowledge your dominion. We acknowledge your majesty. We declare that the, you are the maker and the ruler of every and earth and the entire universe. Father, we give you glory today. Almighty God, we want to thank you for bringing us together to study as your full, at your full stool. Father, we yield our soul and everything that is within us. We ask for your spirit to fill our spirit. Grant us understanding and the wisdom that goes with your word. Father, let us use your word to be able to glorify your name. And let us also use it to move closer and secure our eternal life. Thank you, King of Glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Early this year, we studied a similar topic, the audacity of faith. Before we go into today's lesson, I would like to draw us back into this lesson and summarize what, what we learned there so that we'll be able to draw a contrast between what we're going to learn today and what we learned then. In the audacity of faith, we drew our anchor passage from Mark 11, 22 to 24. Mark 11, 22 to 24. And I read, So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever say to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Praise the Lord. Now, this passage you just read summarizes the kind of faith that Jesus Christ expects us to exercise in our day-to-day -day living. For example, the faith we should demonstrate or that we demonstrate when we pray for, say, protection, for provision, for healing, and other desires of our heart. And God is always there to answer them. This is what I would call the foundation of our faith. This is very important to believers because it is the foundation that we will build on. It requires determination. The key element of this faith is that we have to renew it every day. 
because Satan is very much aware of the fickle mindedness, the weaknesses of mortals, and those weaknesses that are brought about by our flesh. That is why he locks in the corner, waiting for us to fall, then he can pounce and, you know, steal our testimonies. So how do I know this? How do I know this? John chapter 10 verse 10 tells me this. John 10 verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Strat Satan is very strategic. He knows this faith requires constant renewal and that it is never final. He will continue to try to bring children of God down. He retreats anytime we win, anytime we are steadfast about our faith and we win the fight for the day. So he retreats to be able to fight another day. I will draw an analogy from the prelim preliminaries in a football tournament. In this case, a team can strategically win, I mean, sorry, can strategically lose or draw a match. For example, if the team has already qualified with a game in hand, the team can decide to rest its players and it doesn't matter whether that match is lost or won because they have already qualified. So it's a strategic calculation for the team. And if you judge the team by that result, it will be a mistake. So if we win a battle against Satan concerning a particular issue, and we tend to underestimate Satan, then we're making a mistake. This is the kind of tactics or tactical move Satan can take in fighting our faith at this level. Satan can concede defeat for a season, but he is never down permanently. Again, we can draw from the Bible to really confirm this assertion. This is when Jesus, I mean, when Satan tempted Jesus. Satan considered when Jesus defeated him roundly by quoting from the scripture, but he retreated to fight another day. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke 4, Luke 4, 13, Luke 4, 13. The Bible says, now when the devil had, end, had, had ended every, tempt, every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. I want us to take note of that, until an opportune time. So, Satan bowed. He retreated. But from what we have just read, he was never out. He kept waiting, looking around the corner for an opportune time. Today, we're going to look at faith from another dimension. Faith where Satan loses permanently, where Satan is unable to come back. And this is what requires a good fight of faith where satan goes down permanently and we're going to look at a part of anchor passage again but this time around i will go back one chapter and go forward one chapter to give it a full context so let's turn our bibles to second timothy 4 6 to 8. 4, 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, 
and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have, who, who have loved his appearing. As Paul neared the end of his life, Paul could confidently say that he had been faithful to his call. Thus, he faced death calmly, knowing that he will be rewarded by Christ. Is your life preparing you for death? Do you share Paul's confident expectation of meeting Christ? The good news is that the heavenly reward is not just for giants in faith like Paul, but for all those who are eagerly looking forward to Christ's second coming. Paul gave this word to encourage Timothy and us so that no matter how difficult the fight seems, we can keep fighting. When we are with Jesus Christ, we will discover that it is worth it. This is what I will come call the ultimate fight of faith. The, the, the end game scenario. The ultimate test of our faith. Now, let's also look at the Bible to look, I mean, to, to, to take the definition of faith. What does the Bible, how does Bible, did that Bible describe faith? In Hebrews 11, 1, 1, 11, chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says, tells us now, now faith is the substance of thing hoped for, the evidence of thing not seen. The fight that Paul referred to in 2 Timothy 4, 7, is the end game scenario of faith. The faith that lands us the trophy. The faith that gives us the ultimate win. In this end game scenario, there are two, two fighters remain in the, in, the, in the arena and one must go down permanently. One will win permanently. It's like the final in a game the final, let's say the final in a football game. Once the whistle is blown and the game has ended, whoever wins takes home the trophy and whoever loses will go home as the loser. This is where, this is one of the reasons or this is the main reason that Satan becomes very ferocious because he wants to prevent this from happening. He is a fighter. He wants to prevent the children of God from winning because he knows that once the game is won, it's all over. He cannot touch the soul or the spirit of that person anymore. So fighting a good fight of faith implies that we are fighting an adversary. There is an opponent. In this context, it is a fight to gain eternal life. This is why where Satan becomes very determined. Its adversarial role, be, 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 he, he assumed that adversarial role because once we cross the Rubicon, he can neither touch our soul nor our spirit. This is the nature of the adversary we are fighting. This is what he knows that a lot of us may not know, and this is what we must know. So now, what is the nature of this adversary? What is the nature of this adversary? This, this, this adversary, or the adversaries we fight when we want to put on a good fight of faith? We must know the adversary we are fighting. Now, we're going to look at three types of adversary so that we fight when we fight or we go out to fight a good fight of faith. Number one, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. These are basically adversaries we fight 
in the spirit realm. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians 6, 10 to 12. Ephesians 6, 10 to 12. Paul said to the Ephesians, in Ephesians 6, 10 to 12, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the old armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Praise the Lord. So who are principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places? Who are they? These are spiritual powers or adversaries fighting us to prevent us from entering the eternal kingdom of God. They operate in the spirit realm. We cannot see them, but they are very savage. They must not be underestimated. The Christian life battle against principalities, power, and 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 and, and the power and the powerful evil forces of fallen angels, headed by the devil himself, by Satan himself, who is a vicious fighter. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Peter 5 8. 1 Peter 5 8. The Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. This is the savage nature of this adversary, like a roaring, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Praise the Lord. So we start the attack. We must depend on God's strength and use every piece of his armor. Paul is not only giving this counsel to the church as a body, but to every individual who is a member of the church of Christ. The whole body needs to be armed because the strength of a team is to the extent of the weakest member. So the whole body needs to be armed. So as we do battle against the rulers of the darkness of this age, we must find the strength in the church whose power come from the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. In verse 12, in verse 12 of Ephesians 6, the scripture refers to flesh and blood. These are not, those who are not flesh and, bo and blood are demons over whom the devil has control. They are, they are not mere fantasies. They are very real. We fight a powerful army whose goal is to defeat the Christ church and the children of God. When we have faith in Christ, those being become, they, these being become our enemies and they try every device to turn us away from him and back to sin. This is where fighting a good fight of faith becomes imperative. Although we are assured of victory, we must engage in the struggle until Christ returns. Or if he tarries and we are called home, we must constantly be battling against all those who are not on the Lord's side. And God or Jesus Christ will also be battling against these four, four forces in favor of those who are on the Lord's side. We need supernatural power to defeat Satan, and God has provided this by giving us the Holy Spirit within us and, and armor surrounding us if we feel discouraged. Remember Jesus' word to Peter, on this rock I will build my church and the gate of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. So this is our ultimate good fight of faith. To pull through, we must have unflinching faith in Christ to see us through. Praise the Lord. 
So how do we set out to fight these adver adversaries? That is, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Let's turn our Bibles to how do we set about fighting them. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapon of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down argument and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your, disobe your disobedience is fulfilled. Praise the Lord. We, like Paul, are mere weak humans. We are mere mortars. But we don't need to use human plan and methods to win our battles. God mighty weapons are available to us as we fight against Satan's stronghold. Christians must choose whose method to use, God's or the world's. Paul assures us that the mighty weapon, our mighty weapon is prayer, unflinching faith in Jesus Christ, hope, love, then the word, then Holy Spirit. These are the most e effective and the most powerful weapon that we have at our disposal. Let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians 6, 3 to 18. Ephesians 6, 3 to 18. Therefore, take up the old armor of God, that they may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having guided your waist with truth, having put on the best plate of righteousness, and having showed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith with you. We'll be able to quench all the fairy dart of the wicked ones and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying all, always with all prayers and supplications in the spirit, being watchful to this end and with all perseverance and supplication for all sin. This weapon can break down proud mean argument against God, proud man's argument against God, and walls that Satan built to keep people from finding God. When dealing with people's proud argument that keep them from relationship with Christ, we may be tempted to use our own method, but nothing can break down these barriers like God's weapon. The use of this weapon requires faith. Just as we have read, everything that Paul referred to are what we just summarized, our faith, the word of God. Perseverance, pressing forward, and having, having, having I mean, being rest assured that God is, we fight on our, on our side. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In, in, in verse, verse 5, Paul uses military terminology to, de to, to, to describe this warfare against the Satan. God, if he is, is using military terminology, it means God must be the commander-in-chief. God must be the one to direct us. Even our thoughts must be submitted to his control as we, as we live for him. Spirits empowered believers must capture every thought and yield to Christ. When exposed to ideas or opportunities that might lead to wrong opportunities, that might lead to wrong desires, when we, when we have a choice, we can recognize the danger and turn away, or we can allow unhealthy thoughts to take us captive. 
You capture your fantasies and desire when you honestly admit them to the Lord and ask him to, derive, to, to redirect your thinking. Ask God to give you spirit of discernment to keep your thoughts focused on truth. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, we're going to the next adversary. Number two, the next adversary that we must fight when we fight the good fight of faith. And this adversary is the enemy within. The enemy within. Our own flesh. This is, very, this is a very formidable ad adversary because the adversary lives within us. They are parts and parcels of us. They know our weak points and they find it easy to attack. We all know that. The easiest, the, you know, the, 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 the worst adversary we can, we can fight is that adversary who lives within us, who can attack us from within, who knows our game plan, who knows our strength and our weaknesses, and are able to attack us when we are at the weakest. These adversaries don't engage until we are focused on the internal glory. Now, think about it. Before we give our lives to Christ, there are things we do with reckless abandon, and they seem fine, but the moment we gave our lives to Christ, then each day becomes a struggle. Struggle against this sin. Let's read Paul's experience concerning the flesh, fighting against the flesh, fighting the enemy from within. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans 7 and I read from verses 14 to 25. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that I will not do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present within me, with, with me, the one who wish to do. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my member, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my member, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, when the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Praise the Lord. This was Paul lamenting. You know, Paul, was not just an ordinary Christian. Paul is, was one of the greatest apostles that ever lived. And he was lamenting that the things he would ordinarily do that is right, he found it difficult to do them. And the things that he should not be doing, those are the things that the flesh directs him to do. Now, Paul shares three lessons that he learned trying to deal with the sinful desires of the flesh. Number one is the knowledge of the rule is not the answer. Paul felt free as long as he did not understand what the law demanded. When he learned the truth, he knew he was doomed. The flesh allowed him. 
But it was when he learned the truth that he knew he has gone far in the wrong direction. The second lesson that Paul learned is was about self-determination. Struggle in one's own strength does not succeed, as we, 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 we found in verse 15. Paul found himself sinning in ways that weren't even attractive to him, yet he continued to do those things. And the third lesson that we can draw from Paul's lamentation is becoming a Christian does not stamp out all sins and temptation from person's life. So being born again takes a moment from, I mean, a moment of faith. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9, 24-27. Being born again takes a moment of faith, and it requires us to fight this good fight of faith. Let's read 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Do you know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for this prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it to subjection, lest when I've preached to others, I myself should not be disqualified. This we can also, this can also be corroborated with our anchor passage as asserted by, by Paul. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Thus, as Paul has been emphasizing since the beginning of this letter to, the, to, the, to, to Timothy, no one in the world is innocent. No one deserves to be saved. The worst of believers who doesn't know God's law, not even the person who knows them and tries to keep them. All of us must depend totally on the work of Christ for our salvation. We cannot earn it by good behavior. In Romans 7, Romans 7 verse 50, 15 shows us that this is more than a cry of a desperate man. It describes the experience of all Christians struggle against sin, trying to please God for keeping rules and laws without spirit help. We must never underestimate the power of sin and attempt to fight it with our own strength. Satan is very crafty tempter. We have said that before. Satan is very strategic. And we have an amazing we. Also, we are, we are accessories. To his, to, his, to, his, to his modus operandi because we have amazing ability to make excuses like God understands. God knows I'm just human. Instead of trying to overcome sin with our own human power, we must take hold of God's provision for victory over sin. The Holy Spirit who lives within us gives us power and when we fail, he lovingly reaches out to help us. The law in my member you know, which Paul alluded to, is the sin nature deep within us. It is, the vulner it is our vulnerability to sin. It refers to everything within us that are more loyal to our old ways of selfish li living than God. There is a great tension in daily Christian experience. The conflict is that we agree that God's commands but cannot do them. As a result, we are Painfully aware of our sins, this inward struggle with sins was as real for Paul as it is real for us. So how then do we fight this adversary, the adversary that lives within, that is our flesh? 
how do we fight our sinful desires? From Paul, we learn what to do about it. From the scriptures we read, we learn what to do about it. Whenever we feel overwhelmed by spiritual battle, we should go to the beginning of our spiritual life. Just as Paul did, he went to the beginning of the spiritual life. Let's cast us our mind back to when we gave our lives to Christ. We are full of zeal. Zeal. Very zealous for the word of God. Remembering how he freed us from the sin by Jesus Christ. Because at that time, we admitted our sin, we confessed our sin, and we asked for God to help us going forward. It is that simple, going, taking the mindset of when we gave our life to Christ. The time when, so anytime we feel confused and overwhelmed by sin appeal, let us claim the freedom that Christ gave us. His power to lift us out of victory, to lift up into victory. Praise the Lord. At this time, we go to the third adversary, the third adversary that is constantly fighting against our salvation, an adversary against which, against whom we must put a good fight of faith. Praise the Lord. And that adversary, that third adversary, is a strong man. When I say a strong man, a strong man in a literal sense, in a physical sense, a person or persons who willfully and unwittingly are agents of Satan, intent on destroying the children of God. This can be person or people who have authority over us or who are able to manipulate us, who are stronger than us and bent on having us serve their idols or turning us against the will of God. Or there are people who have given their lives to Satan and seeking courts to take them to take down along with them. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke 11. Luke 11, 21 to 22. Luke 11, 21 to 22. When a strong man, fully armed, armed, guard his own palace, his goods as, are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides its spoils. Praise the Lord. Now, the initial strong man who guards is that man who had given his life to Christ. Now, we can split them into two now. Who has given his, his life into Christ? I mean, who has given his life to Christ? So when he guides with the help of the Holy Spirit, the strong man cannot gain a stronghold. However, when he backslides, the strong man will come in. That is when we, we, we yield to certain suggestion. We yield to being to coercion of some people who are stronger than us. So that is what the Bible refers to as when he overcomes. Now, the other person, the other first level, the, first, the, the, the other first set of strong men that, uh, that the Bible refers to are those who rely on their ability. The, because the Bible, the, the Bible says that he takes from him all his armor in which he trusts. This is Luke eleven twenty two. He takes from him his armor in which he trusts and divides his poor. His poor. So this is somebody who is not as opposed to the person who, who is born again and has back 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 slides back slides slided. This one has not given his, his life to Christ, but he trusts in his armor. Praise the Lord. Now, the Bible, the, uh, the example of a strong man in the Bible can be found in the book of Daniel, Daniel 3, 8 to 18. It is the story of King Nebuchadnezzar who wanted to bring down Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
Let's turn our Bibles to Daniel 3, 8 to 18. Daniel 3, 8 to 18. To see the nature of this strong man and to see how we can relate to this in our lives. Daniel 3, 8 to 18. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews who you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due. Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my God or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and sultry in symphony, with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image I have made good, I have made good, but if you do not worship, you shall, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of burning fairy furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fairy furnace and it will deliver us from your hand O king but if not let it be known to you O king that we do not serve your god nor we will we worship the gold image which you have set up praise the lord praise the lord so the king unleashed his powerful force against these three men they were under him. Remember, you know, when the, uh, the child there made the report, he said, those you have set to rule the province, um, certain provinces. So they were favored by Nebuchadnezzar because of the wisdom that God gave them. So they were intent on bringing King Nebuchadnezzar had already sold his soul to Satan. He was an avid idol worshiper. So, and he wanted to take down these three men with him and they will not have they will not have a part of it so how do we fight this kind of men as we just read is to is by direct confrontation frontal confront, confrontation these three men, three men fought a good fight of faith when they confronted Nebuchadnezzar because they were determined not to serve his idol and they were determined to die. That was a case of, it's a classical case of end game. If they had died in the fairy furnace, they would have won eternally so they will have won the end game, which Nebuchadnezzar did not understand. He thought by killing them, he had won. But note, note that if he killed them, they will have won because they will have gained eternal glory. Now, this directly confirms what the scripture tells us in Matthew 10, 28. Matthew 10, 20, 28. And the Bible says in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who is that person? 
that can destroy both soul and body. That is the giver of the body and soul, which is the God Almighty. Now, at this point, I want us to pause. I want us to draw, now we have said, by direct conf confrontation. There is another story in the Bible that seems to suggest otherwise. That we may not fight this strong man frontally. We may not confront this strong man. This is the story of Elijah. This is the story of Elijah when Jezebel threatened to kill him. Elijah fled. He ran away to fight another day. Let's read the account in the Bible. This, in this case, it was not a strong man. It was a strong woman. Jezebel. First King 19, 1 to 4. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also, how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the God do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of the ones of them by tomorrow, about this time. When he saw that, he arose and ran for his life, and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said it is enough now lord take take my life for i'm no better than my than my father's now jeremiah sorry elijah elijah realized the enormity of jezebel's power Jezebel, let's, let's put context to what we just read. You know, Elijah challenged the prophet of Baal, which were also working for Jezebel. He challenged them to a contest. They set up their offering without fire, and he asked the prophet of Baal to call down fire. If their God was real and that he will also call you know uh, call down fire through his own god the prophet of baal they danced all day long around the offering but the power but 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 no fire came down but in the case of Jerem, um, of uh, of elijah he set up his altar he put the offering there and god answered him by fire so when he won that battle, when he won that duel or competition, whatever we want to call it, he set against the prophet of Baal and he slaughtered quite a number of them. So it was revenge that Jezebel wanted from Elijah when he said, by this time tomorrow, I am coming for your head. Unless who was Jezebel? Jezebel despised God's authority and power. In this case, by extension, he despised Elijah, who was the prophet of God. As we know, Jezebel was a master manipulator. He manipulated through authority, appointing, I mean, uh, attempting to lead through them. In this case, he manipulated Ahab in attitude. Ahab abdicated and allows his queen Jezebel to have control over God's people. When Jezebel hears, Jezebel hears of, the, of the defeat of his prophets at Mount Carmel and breathed out a vow proclaiming to kill Elijah within a day, the mighty man of God, that is Elijah, he met when he heard the threat. Elijah ran for his life. All his strength and power left him, and he asked God, 
if you could die, what happened? What caused the dramatic change of spirit and heart? Can a single thread from a single person bring such effect? Yes, the vileness of Jezebel's spirit carried something unusual. The spirit, as spirits, sought to keep prophecy. It is an anti-prophet spirit who comes in on places where the word of God is powerful and is especially backed by signs and wonders. It can strike at any time, great victory and, su and, and successes. It releases a cycle of confusion, bringing div division and despair. And this kind of, for of force requires a good fight, a, a fight, a good fight of faith. Can we say Elijah did not have faith? Somebody who called fire from heaven. Somebody who prophesied that there will be famine, there will be drought, and he also prophesied that there will be plenty. Elijah was a strong man of God, yet Elijah ran. Elijah ran from this strong man for self-preservation. He ran to fight another day. Now, when Elijah went to God, when Elijah went to God in Beersheba, in the wilderness, when he went to the wilderness, one thing I know is that, I mean, can we say it was right for Elijah to run? But one thing we know is that Elijah, I mean, God did not rebuke Elijah. Rather, God asked him to anoint Elisha. Let's, 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 let's read the, you know, what God told him. Um, in let's turn our Bibles to First King, nineteen, verse sixteen. First King nineteen verse sixteen. Also, this is what God told him when He said God should take His life. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shamphat of Abel Mehula. You shall anoint as prophet in your place. Elijah ran from this strong woman. God asked him to anoint King Jehu. It was King Jehu who ended up killing Jezebel. So, can we say we should always confront or we should always confront a strong man. There is another reference in the Bible where God instructed Joseph to run, to take Christ, to run from Herod, who we can also describe as a strong man because he sought to destroy Jesus Christ. So he made a decree that all children from each two that was should be should be should be should be executed, knowing fully well that Jesus Christ will be amongst them. And what did did God, what instruction did God give Joseph? We find it in Matthew two thirteen, Matthew two thirteen. Now when they are departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, "Arise, take the young child and his mother." Flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you the word. For Herod will seek to kill and destroy him. They fled. The bottom line here is this. Where, where we can stand to fight the strong man? I mean, sorry, should we, st should we stand and confront the, the, the strong man? Or should we run to fight another day? Whichever way, as we have seen from the Bible, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego demonstrated that it, can, it is right to stand up to the strong man and show the, the power of God. And God delivered them. In the case of Elijah, he ran for his life and God still delivered him. In the case of Joseph and the baby Christ, God asked them to run, and God delivered them. 
So whichever the case may be, let us listen to the Holy Spirit. Let us listen to the Spirit of God to direct us as to what we should do. Because the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 2, 9, by, for by strength no man shall prevail. For by strength no man shall prevail. So let us depend on what the Spirit directs us. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. I'm, first of all, I'm going to pray for a set of people who are saying that fighting a good fight of faith can be very problematic for them. They do not know what it even means to have faith. I am telling you now that you need to give your life to Christ. Because once you give your life to Christ, it will teach you how to fight a good fight of faith. So let me pray with those sets. If you are one, if you are one of those, please join me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, King of Glory, I pray for everyone listening to me who have purposed in their minds, in their hearts, in their spirit to give their life to Christ. That Father, you see their hearts. We ask, I ask for forgiveness of their sins. I pray that you give them the fortitude to step away from these sins, to forsake them entirely in their lives in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that you grant them the determination to yield to you, the faith to yield their lives to you in everything to do, in everything they will do. Father, help them and bring them into your fold. Be their, 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 their Lord and Savior and direct their lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We give you honor and glory and adoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you have said amen to that prayer, you are, I welcome you to the household of faith and I ask you to join others as I do, as I round up with a prayer. Everlasting King of Glory, we just want to thank you for this time that we have spent in your presence. We want to thank you for your spirit that has led us through today's study. Father, Lord, we have learned about fighting a good fight of faith. Lord, we cannot fight this fight because according to your word, by strength shall no man prevail. Father, we depend on you to help us. Father, help us to fight those adversary that lock in the spirit realm like the principalities and power and the rulers of darkness in heavenly places. Father, help us to fight them in our spirit. Almighty Father, help us to also fight those adversaries that are within our flesh, that are within us, our flesh. Father, help us to daily die, to, to daily kill our flesh. Father, help us so that we can rise above sin and that by faith we can gain that eternal crown. Father, Lord, should there be any strong man who is there to confront any one of us according to your word, Lord God Almighty, put the, the mark of Christ on our head so that no one will trouble us again in the mighty name of Jesus. Help us to fight the good fight of faith. Help us, Lord, so that at the end of it all, we will gain the eternal crown. Thank you, everlasting Father. We give you all the glory, honor, and adoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. I thank you for joining us. Please join us again next week because we still have two more lessons on, the, on this topic, fight a good fight of faith. So join us the same time next week and the following week in, 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 in July. And God will bless you mightily as you do so in Jesus' name. Shall we share the grace in fellowship? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.